uh, part one on investigations. Um, my name's Trevor Wiles. I'm a partner at Forensic uh, Risk Alliance. Uh, if you don't know the company, we're a firm that specializes in forensic accounting, forensic technology, data governance, and monitoring services. I'm delighted to be here uh, and to moderate this fantastic panel. Um, you, Hopefully you've all had a chance to read the hypothetical which was uh, posted online and Andrew kindly ran through the hypothetical again this morning. If you need a third go, I'm going to set some slides running in a second which will, which will also go through the hypothetical because obviously you'll, you'll need to understand it in a good way to, to be asking lots of questions and, and making comments. Uh, I would like to thank Stephanie Yonokura from Hogan Lovells who wrote the uh, case study and you'll be seeing her on the second panel this afternoon. So um, first I'd like to sort of run through my panelists and, and introduce them. On my right is uh, Mara Sen. Mara is a senior investigator and senior litigation specialist at the Integrity Vice Presidency at the World Bank, where she investigates allegations of corruption, fraud, collusion, obstruction and coercion in World Bank finance <coughs> projects around the world. <coughs> and litigates them in front of the World Bank Sanctions Board, seeking disbarment, debarment of companies and individuals from World Bank funding. Prior to the World Bank, Mara was Federal International Corruption Prosecutor at the DOJ, who found, froze, and forfeited the hidden assets of corrupt dictators and leaders around the world, and prosecuted involved individuals. Before the DOJ, Mara was a partner uh, the white collar crime, uh, sorry, a white collar partner at Arnold Porter. Next, we have Nick Harbist. Nick's uh, a seasoned trial lawyer, former assistant U.S. attorney, and nationally recognised lecturer on white collar crime, and concentrates his practice in complex criminal and commercial litigation. Nick represents clients in a variety of industries in matters related to fraud, FCPA, antitrust, securities, trade secrets, healthcare litigation internal investigations, corporate compliance programs, false claims act and whistleblower litigation. Nick is consistently recognized by the international who's who of business crime defense lawyers and the international who's who of international investigation lawyers. To Nick's right is Zoe Newman. Zoe is a managing director in Kroll's business intelligence, intelligence and investigations practice and co-heads the, their global financial investigations team. Zoe has extensive experience in leading complex cross-border forensic investigations into matters of fraud, corruption, and potential regulatory breaches, including those related to the FCPA and UK Bribery Act. She also advises clients on how to best implement controls to mitigate these risks. And finally, but not least, to the furthest right is Joe Whitley. Joe serves as chair of Baker Donaldson's Government Enforcement Investigations Practice. Joe's practice focuses on corporate defense and representation of clients in complex civil and criminal enforcement matters brought by the DOJ, other federal agencies, state uh, attorneys general and local prosecutors. Joe has represented numerous individuals and corporations in major investigations throughout the US and internationally. Right. Um, I'm going to take a, a moderator's um, privilege and ask each of my panelists uh, a question to get the ball rolling. And then I'm going to turn it over to you, the audience, to um, ask questions and to make comments. Uh, as I promised, I'm just going to run through. Hopefully this will start. Right. Right. So you'll, you should see up on the screen the hypothetical. So um, if you're not familiar with it, please make some notes as this was the uh, matter we will be discussing. Um, it's quite a, a long uh, hypothetical. There's plenty of issues in there. We're probably going to jump around the topic. So don't worry if we go back to another topic that maybe we've previously asked. But uh, I'm going to uh, open the questions uh, with Joe. Um, Joe, having read the hypothetical, right. uh, what do you consider are the key allegations that um, need investigating the laws that might have been broken. Well, thank you, Trevor, and it's good to be on this panel, and thank you to the organizers of the, of the program. It's uh, a delight to be here, and thanks to the uh, ABA staff for uh, the great job they always do putting this program on. So uh, as I looked at the, uh, the hypothetical, which is a one-pager, 
right here. Uh, it's got a lot in it. It's sort of a like Prego spaghetti sauce. It's, uh, <laughs> it's in there somewhere, right, as we think about it. Um, so I prepared this uh, one-page document that uh, I can hand out later, but it goes through essentially a list of crimes and activity that might come under the jurisdiction of different places, including, uh, and tomorrow's going to talk about the World Bank in a moment. But um, as, as you look at this, um, I think about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act sort of initially uh, as I look at the paragraphs uh, here, and I've numbered them out. I guess the second paragraph um, talks about the bidding process uh, where the owner of Company A exchanged emails with a procurement specialist who is a, a public official, which is always a trigger word uh, when you have a public official uh, in a situation. So was the, there's an allegation of a disbursement uh, to the procurement specialist, which is referenced in that paragraph. And so that could, that's the sign of, sign of, of the FCPA. Is there, you know, is there money being paid to obtain or retain business? And uh, it was a thing of value paid. So that's sort of one thing right out of the box, uh, Trevor, that jumps out at me. Um, and so this would be, again, the jurisdiction would be that Company A is a U.S. corporation and Company the individual at Company A is a U.S. citizen. So this looks a little bit like an FCPA violation. Um, um, and also, um, there's, there's much here that Mara is going to touch on, I think, that touches on the other other issues associated with the World Bank, which has uh, sanctions jurisdiction, which parallels the FCPA, in, at least in my understanding. Uh, I would also think that conspiracy would be another provision under U.S. law that would be used usually 18 United States Code, Section 371, conspiracy uh, would be something you'd be looking at to pull all this together if you're investigating it. So two or more persons conspiring to commit uh, any offense against the United States and one or more persons uh, do any act uh, to affect the object of that conspiracy. So that would be another uh, statute that I think would apply here right at the very beginning. Um, there is there is bribery going on here. There are kickbacks happening. Um, there is no federal uh, statute which, by its terms, uh, prohibits uh, commercial bribery. Uh, however, uh, there are state laws in the United States. Thirty-six states out of the fifty United States states have commercial bribery laws prohibiting commercial bribery. <coughs> So I think under what is called the Travel Act, where there is travel in interstate commerce uh, to commit a crime, almost any crime, the Travel Act would be applicable uh, to the conduct that's referenced in actually the third paragraph of this uh, hypothetical. Um, and, and, and also, uh, always in any criminal case in the United States, and uh, any our reach of so extraterritorial, uh, 18 United States Code Section 1341, and 18 United States Code Section 1343 are the wire fraud and mail fraud statutes that really um, capture almost anything that is a scheme or artifice to defraud. So if interstate wire facilities were used and they were in the situation or emails are, are, are used, uh, that could trigger, Trevor, the, uh, those statutes. Um, and again, uh, the Travel Act is something that um, would, would be very useful here, which says whoever travels in interstate or foreign commerce or uses the mail or any facility in interstate commerce or foreign commerce with the intent to otherwise promote, manage, establish, carry on, or facilitate the promotion, management, establishment of any unlawful activity. So you see how broad that is. Um, as we move along through the hypothetical, um, there is the opportunity for... The, the insertion of U.S. money laundering laws into the conduct that's uh, being engaged in under uh, the two primary money laundering statutes in the United States are 18 U.S.C. 1956 and 1957. Uh, cryptocurrency is used uh, in, in the conduct uh, that people are engaging in here, and I'm not trying to step into other areas where other com comments will be made, but 820 bitcoins um, it's worth a great deal. Each Bitcoin is worth about $8,000 today. So we have a, a number of about six and a half million dollars moving around here uh, by wire. And I think the, um, the movement of the money is, uh, would fit within what you heard yesterday about specified unlawful activities. The 
all the all the crimes I've just alluded to previously, many of them are, are predicate acts for the money laundering statute application to the conduct in this uh, particular situation. Um, also, there's conduct um, by um, particularly the individual who is from Company A. It could arguably be seen as obstruction of justice type conduct. He, uh, once he is aware the investigation is underway, he begins to set about making a lot of these transfers uh, after, after the interview. Um, and um, back to Prego spaghetti sauce uh, with this uh, particular uh, discussion. Um, there are other tax violations that could be involved here. The IRS is very aggressive worldwide in pursuing uh, tax cases. Just like a few years ago, in the, in the late, um, I think around 2009, the IRS began to pursue bank accounts uh, in Switzerland where money was being held, uh, not tax reported income being held there. So I think there will be uh, the issuance of uh, potentially of subpoenas to uh, camp, uh, obviously camp BX, which is one of the uh, money, money holders for the, uh, the bitcoins. But uh, I think uh, there could be an application in this situation also of other criminal activity. And in the FCPA cases that I've been involved with, you also could have antitrust violations happening where you have uh, price fixing going on or the, the tinkering with pricing uh, that, is, that is occurring here. So again, some of this may be a little a bit of a stretch. <clears throat> and also uh, the actors in this situation have to be worried about seizure and forfeiture of their property, the uh, once this money starts moving around all over the place like a ping pong ball, um, what you are be, you're looking for are assets to seize. And the and the and the greatest tool that I think came about in the 1986 uh, statute that I was, I'm unfortunately familiar with that emboldened the United States in the asset forfeiture area is the ability to seize assets. And, and, and cripple an organization where there's activity that's corrupt. So I, I would say that that would likely happen under U.S. provisions that I, that I have in this list of potential crimes. Um, obviously, the Department of Justice uh, in this investigation and UK, uh, the UK, the SFO, are working closely with the World Bank, uh, Trevor, to make sure that all of these things are, are captured. But that's just a little bit of a taste of what you could be seeing. Yeah, a little bit of a taste, but still a lot of uh, of um, potential laws broken there. So quite hey, a lot. Trevor, before you before, just to get more context to what Philip just said, yes. can you just give for those of us that have not read the hypothetical, just sort of the broad brushstrokes of the story? I think it would put what you were saying in the Sure, I'll, I'll I'll go through that. So you don't have to read the whole thing. It's really good. Yeah. That's that's fine. So thanks, Nina. Um, so the hypo really starts with a World Bank funded uh, loan uh, to assist with road production in a uh, country, country X. Uh, the contract for that uh, road building is won by uh, company A, uh, who is a US, uh, which is owned by a US citizen. The uh, sub in, in, in that contract, uh, he gives a subcontract to uh, company B. Uh, and the allegations run is is is, an, is an, there are a number of allegations effectively in here. One is that there seems to be some um, improper contact between Company A and the procurement specialist for the country awarding the contract. In fact, there is a uh, a meeting that is um, undertaken after submission of company's <coughs> A's proposal to discuss the procurement process further and a pending, in quotes, disbursement. So therefore, you know, is there something untoward? Why would the procurement specialist be going to, to meet with the company A and what is this potential disbursement? And uh, the contract is awarded to company A literally 10 days later. It's a 100 million US dollar contract. Once the investigation is commenced, we understand that Company B has paid kickbacks to Company A, or that's the allegation, and the way that that is facilitated is through the use of inflated invoices from Company B to Company A for equipment uh, purchased. The, uh, the then case study then goes on into talking around how company, uh, 
the owner of company A potentially is moving his money. It appears he is paid by company B in the form of Bitcoin. He moves that through a number of exchanges. He breaks the transaction out, but it all coalesces back with one exchange. And then he converts that into money, uh, seemingly into uh, a Wells Fargo bank account. And he transfers some of that money uh, to an accomplice or a person that he has a relationship with. So that's the, the broad case study. And Joe has kindly sort of gone through some of the laws that were broken in that. Um, if, I, if for now, I would like to turn to um, Tamara. And having listened to the fact pattern, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the work around the um, World Bank Integrity Vice Presidency, and particularly in this hypothetical, what factors would allow you to have jurisdiction over this investigation? So I'll just give a brief background on how the World Bank works in terms of these sorts of investigations. It's essentially a contract-based liability. So what happens is the World Bank disperses money to a country, uh, to in this case build roads, and the country then um, creates an, an entity that is full of um, uh, foreign officials from the FCPA perspective or just government officials. And that organization then lets out the contracts. So they put up the contracts for bid. Within both the loan agreements to the country or the grant agreements and also within the contracts that are bid, there is a provision that basically says, uh, don't do all the bad things that the World Bank prohibits. And um, <laughs> there are five of them. Um, one of them, the one that's primarily at issue here is um, fraud. Um, so you can't defraud. Um, in this case, defrauding really means defrauding the government officials. So if you defraud other people that are not involved from the government side, that doesn't count. So if you defraud your co-contractors um, or your subcontractors, that is not um, justiciable by the World Bank. You can't um, uh, engage in corrupt practices, which is just like FCPA. You can't bribe people. Uh, you can't engage in collusion, which is basically in this context um, bid fixing. So you can't. We have cases where people get together and say, "Okay, you bid highest, no, and then I'll get the next one." So you can't do that. Um, the fourth one is coercion, which we rarely see because it's hard to um, to prove. But coercion is basically like, you know, if you bid for this contract, I'll kill you. Um, also bad. Um, we did <laughs> we did have one case before my time, um, which was very unusual because, like I said, it's very difficult to. Um, prove, but someone actually came into a, 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 a co-contractor, um, called up his competitor and said, hey, come meet me at a bar. So he was there with the foreign official. And basically they said, you know, we're going to like kill your family uh, if you bid for this. And luckily for our purposes, he had a, um, he turned on his phone and he got it all on tape. So that was bad for that person. Um, but we barely see those kinds of cases. And then the last one is um, obstruction, which is very similar to obstruction in all jurisdictions. Um, and what also is included in the contracts is an, uh, is an audit clause. And the audit clause allows us to get all documents, uh, accounting documents, and to uh, interview people. But it's only information within the control of that company. So we can't reach beyond that company. Um, in theory, uh, well, not in theory, but it, in most contracts, you also, the contractor is required to include these similar provisions into their subcontractor um, uh, contracts. That very rarely happens. They're supposed to, but then they don't. Um, so it can be difficult for us to get um, uh, audit rights over subcontractors, but we do have jurisdiction to bring cases against sub subcontractors if we get evidence either from the contractor or the subcontractor agrees to, to cooperate with us. Um, so in terms of this hypothetical, um, oh, and, and the other thing is in order for us to meet, um, I'm just gonna focus on fraud here um, and corruption. In order for us to meet each of those provisions, we need to show by our standard, our legal standard is by preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not. Um, and you need to f show either knowledge or recklessness in terms of mens rea. So um, in this case, the two uh, possible um, charges would be, I mean, we call them, they're not really charges, but they're sanctionable practices. 
um, would be either uh, fraud because they submitted um, inflated uh, inflated uh, invoices. So that would be defrauding the government because charging them too much for what was actually done. Um, in this case, it's um, that's proven because Company B admitted they prepared and submitted inflated invoices. Um, so we could definitely charge um, the subcontractor. It's not really clear whether um, Company A uh, knew that they were inflated. We would have to do um, we would have to interview people at Company A um, to determine whether or not they actually knew that because we need knowledge or recklessness. And then the other possibility, um, again, which we don't have fully under this hypothetical, is that um, it's possible from these um, facts that um, that there was that there was a bribe from Company A to the government official. But again, we have this pending disbursement. It's not really clear exactly what that means. So we would again have to interview the. Um, the person from company A, and then we can also uh, get the, um, we can ask for the bank accounts from the company, but we would not have jurisdiction to get the personal accounts from the individual in company A, which are later referenced in the hypothetical where they move the, the Bitcoin around. We, don't, we would not have access to that information under our audit clause, only the company's information. Yeah. So as generally, you guys would get involved after lower or if you see it in the media, how, how would you guys do that on when you use that? Sure, sure. Um, well, typically we have a robust um, uh, reporting system. So people, we get things from all over the place. We do get information from the media. So if we see that, we will, we can go after it. We can, we, we have audit rights just like, um, uh, you know, companies will put audit rights in, in their um, suppliers or things like that. So we could, in theory, we could go after audit rights whenever we wanted. So that's why when we see, see something in the press, if we get a whistleblower report, um, we get reports from, as you can imagine, competitors who are mad they lost a, <laughs> they lost a bid. We get uh, reports from the um, government officials sometimes who say, you know, somebody tried to bribe me or this wasn't fair, however, you know, you do it. We get uh, reports, like in this hypothetical from, hypothetical, from disgruntled former employees. So we get we get information from a whole source of uh, a whole range of sources. And interestingly, we get I, I think it's like we get a, a, a you know a number of thousands per year of reports. But under the hotline that we um, monitor, we uh, most of them, the vast majority, have nothing to do with us. So it's like my boss was mean. They sexually harassed me. You know. So we refer those out or we dismiss them and then we kind of call it down to the ones that are actually within our purview. But that that, that would include if we see something in the press, um, we, we can definitely uh, look into that as well. And, uh, like, for example, we I'm not sure how we how we originally got this, but I mean, we settled with Odebrecht, I think, in Ecuador. So, I mean, you know, that's a, I don't know if we got it from the press, but obviously it was everywhere. So couldn't ignore that. Do you actually uh, file a lawsuit? How do you, how do you sign Good question. That? Yeah, yeah. So so basically, we everything we do is internal to the World Bank. Uh, it's a debarment system, very similar to, I'm not I'm not familiar with the UK system, but in the, U, in the US, you can get debarred um, if you do something improper for federal contracts. So what happens is, um, and we have a similar thing for World Bank contracts. So um, our remedy is basically, we submit something to the Office of Suspension and Debarment, which is similar to a suspension and debarment officer in the Army or the Navy. They determine if we have sufficient evidence. If we have sufficient evidence, um, and then the other side is, you know, is able to comment. But if they find that we have, um, you know, the preponderance of, if we meet the preponderance of evidence standard, then that office actually issues the sanction and they send the company or the individual, we can do both companies and individuals. And they say, okay, you, you're sanctioned based on these facts, you're sanctioned for three years. So the company can either, they have an opportunity at that level to um, provide uh, information from their side and argue from their side. But if they still lose, they then have an appeals process within the world bank called the sanctions board, where they basically get an oral argument. Everything's on the paper up to that moment. And then they um, then in the sanctions board, which is our internal appellate process, 
we um, there's an oral argument. It's it's um, you don't present evidence there. You basically again base it on the papers. But the respondent can appear there, or their and or their attorney can appear. Um, and then the sanctions board is a board of I think there are twelve um, independent um, arbitrators essentially. And then there's a sub panel of three to five. And they um, they are the ones who administer the the hearing, and then they make the decision based on what's been said at the hearing, plus what you know all the evidence that has been submitted within the proceeding. Um, and then they and then they make a determination either yes we support the office of suspension and debarment you get three years, or actually we think you should get five years or eighteen months or whatever it is, and that's the final. There's no there's no further appellate process after that. And once you're on the debarment list, you are no longer, for that amount of time, again, similar to the um, debarment process in the United States, you're not allowed to bid for or receive any money from the World Bank, and you're also not allowed to uh, participate as a vendor to the World Bank. So basically, you're debarred for that amount of time. But once you're done with that time, you just come right back. So, um, But then if you're caught a second time, then your debarment process, I mean, the debarment uh, time period would be uh, very long. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Just one uh, quick quick question. So if a company A doesn't uh, cooperate with the audit rights, does that then move to an obstruction? Yes. Um, uh, the obstruction cases, you really uh, sort of need to get uh, something very definitive from the company, like in writing saying, I will not give you this. Um, and sometimes... Um, as with, uh, I think our our obstruction is probably actually a little weaker than than the you know U.S. government because if they give us a bunch of documents, and then um, like I have a case where the it, it, there's the supervisor they refuse to produce the supervisor for um, from for this guy one of the guys we were going after and the company and but they had given us you know a bunch of people had already met with us we had gotten a bunch of evidence. So in that case, even though technically, like in the United States, if, if, a, if a witness refuses to cooperate with you and you've subpoenaed them, you know, they can be prosecuted for obstruction. In our system, once you've cooperated a bunch, it's harder to get obstruction if there's just like one guy who won't talk to you. So, um, but, but in this particular case, it's possible we would get obstruction because it's, I mean, it seems like besides the former employee, the main guy is company in company A is the, the guy who might have bribed people. Um, so if they gave us access to no none of their employees, then we could probably go for instruction obstruction. Can I, can I ask my question? Sure. So is that. Yeah. Um, just in terms of um, the the selection of company A itself and the size of the loan and the amount yeah. that company A was going to be paid, how much involvement would you? have at the outset of the loan disbursement to um, sort of assess whether it, it, it was of the value necessarily and whether the subcontractor was appropriate to begin yeah. with. Yeah, I mean, so that's really not, I mean, we, the World Bank in theory supervises the the projects. So, but, and what happens is there's a, um, there's a committee for every um, bid process and they, produce what's called a bid evaluation report. So the, the World Bank will review the bid evaluation report and basically issue a no objection letter. So they so let's say there's something omitted from the report or you know they don't pick up on anything and it's not obvious from the face of the report. The World Bank could reach down, but in general they don't really because they just don't have those kind of resources. So if if there's uh and and there's also um in addition to, I mean, we're not the only stopgap. I mean, there are other measures that people take. So there are certain um, uh, bid processes that are called, there's a pre-review and a pre-review and a post-review. A pre-review contract means that before the contract is issued, there is a review process to make sure everything is on the up and up. That's not something we do. That's something the operations do. And so things are caught then. So we get, we get um, reports from um, bid evaluation reports, or people on the bid evaluation committee who have found irregularities. So that's how we get some of our cases. Um, there are some uh, contracts that are called post evaluation reports, which means no one really, I mean, they look at it, but if they don't catch it, there's no official process. 
and then it's it's um, evaluated at the end of the project. And sometimes we get things then, but obviously the pre evaluation will be more likely to catch things ahead of time post it's it's already done but we, we still can go after it i'd like to ask more a question too uh the um we have corrupt practice which is one category of conduct i think world bank looks at and then collusive practice which happens here and and 50 percent plus one is what you're looking at right a preponderance so it has to be it's pretty relatively low standard yeah uh but in terms of these discussions going on between the specialist about the draft bid submission, you know, essentially the the, uh, the sharing of that information, um, that information early, uh, is that something that uh, where somebody's essentially getting the sco inside scoop on the, the bidding process, is that something that would fall within the collusive practice area? Um, no, because usually collusion, coll uh, collusion is typically between uh, competitors as opposed to with the, the, um, the uh, person within the company within the government, um, but if they paid money, then it would be prohibited. And in this case, I mean, again, because the collusion is um, typically uh, to win a bid, um, so like in in it, the collusion has to be against the government. So in this case, <laughs> even though A and B may be colluding to increase the um, the invoices, that would actually be the fr a fraudulent practice under our system. Um, the collusion would be if there's two separate bidders um, who are both going for the same contract and they agree between them to essentially defraud the organization that's choosing the bidders as opposed to colluding with each other for a higher price because they're kind of setting, they're putting themselves forward as one unit meaning they're doing, maybe they're doing the higher bid, but they're doing it as one bid together. And I think the uh, interesting thing about this case study is, is there's probably sort of related um, crimes here because you've got <laughs> the, um, the company A potentially bribing the country procurement officer in order right. possibly to get a higher price, which then gives more scope for him to request a kickback from company A because he can right. pass on the costs. Absolutely. So it all gets interrelated. Mm -hmm. and, and and on that, Zoe, maybe I can just turn to you just from your experience, you know, this, this use of inflated invoices to facilitate kickbacks, is that something typical of what you're seeing from your investigations? Uh, very. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess just to sort of step back a bit, um, in terms of the methods of bribery in this or, or kickback in this in this um, investigation, it's interesting to pick up on what Mara said because often we're called in, um, we don't have the luxury usually of a whistleblower. Um, it's usually because the multilateral donor community or a government um, in sort of a, an emerging market has got a major infrastructure project that's either way behind schedule all the funds have been dispersed and um, not, not much has happened, et cetera. And, and they, the kind of question is, what, what's gone on here? Uh, and the problem we always face is that usually, particularly where there's multiple lenders, there's a massive disconnect between the disbursement and the actual funds that have gone into the um, entity that's actually sort of managing the project. Um, so what we what, it, what is similar and very typical is you have an overarching contractor and then multiple subcontractors underneath. Um, but sort of going back to this morning's discussion, um, by that stage, you've probably got already seven or eight jurisdiction, relevant jurisdictions yeah. in terms of the, the country where the project is, the main contractor, the subcontractors. Um, so you've already got a lack of visibility as to where fund flows have gone to. Um, and usually what we see is often the actual borrowing at the outset is more than was practically necessary. So in the Mozambique um, example, um, there was enormous borrowing that when you actually practically looked um, at what had gone on on the ground and the level of assets that have been purchased, they were way under the actual um, funds dispersed. But to go back to to go back to the, the question uh, in terms of the bribe, um, um, the, the method is similar. However, the actual um, the, the, the way that the bribe is paid 
we don't see cryptocurrency at all in corporate crime. Um, in sort of the countries where this is taking place, it's not relevant. It's still very much in the um, sort of criminal underworld dark web space. Um, what the problem that we do see when you get to the point where you've actually managed to demonstrate a discrepancy between uh, the amount dispersed versus what's actually been um, purchased for the contract or the services purchase <coughs> is, is the very typical and similar um, laundering methods. So it is still extraordinarily easy um, for fraudsters and pay, payers of bribes and recipients of bribes to set up multiple um, corporate entities and bank accounts and launder the funds across multiple jurisdictions. And the problem remains for us investigating it and trying to um, recover funds is the lack of an international body that can actually have visibility over that. And to go back to the point of this seminar, um, it is still usually um, the US authorities that make the most progress um, in, in sort of actually getting to the root cause and proving who has received the bribe and how much has been received. Yeah, so I, I've, I've seen something uh, uh, you know, similar in that in the terms of the inflated invoices, sometimes you can see that as a product or, or something that's sold and they've marked it up and they've overinflated the cost. But sometimes they put in a, a variation order or a service that yeah. is a little bit more difficult. So I've seen car rental or truck rentals, very much more difficult sometimes to work out whether that service was genuinely... Yeah. And to go, to go back to Mara's point, you know, these are major infrastructure projects. You know, I don't know how much a tuna fishing vessel should be <laughs> valued at. So, you know, if you're sitting in DC reviewing a bid evaluation report, how do you know that that's the right value um, for the product? So you do have to sort of come in with proper valuation specialism yeah, to actually absolutely. prove how much that discrepancy is. Um, Nick, um, let's just move more towards the end of the case study. We see the money uh, the, the, for the kickbacks going through a, a multitude of, of, of Bitcoin type transactions and it ends up in a, uh, a bank account in the, which we presume is in the US. The uh, owner then starts moving all the money into uh, an account of an associate of his. Is that a continuation of the money laundering scheme or is that more of an obstruction type? Scheme. Could be both, yeah. but thanks to the ABA for inviting me. Uh, I'll use a baseball ana yeah. analogy. You know, you throw me a little curveball yeah. here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, talking with my my good friend Joe, uh, I thought my role here was merely to agree with Joe, uh, <laughs> which I usually do. And I there would no no independent yeah. thought would be required at this time in the morning for me. Um, but I'll but I'll step step up to the plate and in my uh, true to my mission, well, I Joe, I do agree with you. There is yeah. money laundering right. here. There appears to be money that is uh, uh, flowed from the Bitcoin payments, uh, which could be specified unlawful activity. That is the kickback payments uh, into the accounts of the, uh, the owner of company A, which he has then uh, funneled out from his personal accounts to a uh, third party, uh, I think the, uh, they talk about wiring $250,000 and $45,000 uh, to the third party. And what the authorities would do, of course, uh, would be following the money. Uh, and the hypothetical, um, I'll throw a little sex into the hypothetical and assume that the, uh, the, the, the uh, third party is the company a, A's uh, owner's girlfriend. Uh, and it appears that he has transferred the proceeds uh, into her accounts. Uh, and it, it also would appear that the purpose is to either conceal or further the kickback scheme. And he's essentially parked the money in the girlfriend's accounts. Uh, and that certainly would be significant evidence of money laundering. Uh, obstruction, it really depends if, uh, if the girlfriend is implicated in some way in the kickback scheme, because under U.S. law, a corrupt purpose uh, is required. Um, so if the payoff to her is to keep her silent, uh, then of course uh, there it could be obstruction, uh, but certainly money laundering. And we would really need uh, the services, uh, your services or the services of another forensic accounting uh, firm to trace through the money. And uh, if you're representing certainly company A or company B, you'd want to get to the bottom of that relatively quickly to determine 
what your position is with the authorities because uh, in the hypothetical shows that there's already been a subpoena issued and you have to respond to that. Thank you. So, a uh, chance to open it more to the floor and for comments. So, uh, welcome any questions or comments you might have. Yes. Yeah. So we have we have a formal referral process where basically for any you know as you can imagine many of our um, uh, projects touch many um, countries at the same time. We often have like a large internet multinational, let's say based in Spain, who bids with a local company in Vietnam. Um, so we, in that case, we would actually we we it's our discretion. So but if we see something that's a potential a criminal violation in any country, we send referral reports to, in that case, we would do it to Vietnam and Spain. Um, and then to the extent we see a U.S. jurisdiction, we also could uh, refer it to the DOJ. Um, you know, as you can imagine, we're not, we're, we're not a criminal, we're not a law enforcement agency, we're, since we're primarily administrative or civil. Um, so MLATs don't apply to us. And nor and we are also not within the grand jury secrecy rules for any reason. So um, the we have what's called a memorandum of op, of understanding between the World Bank and enforcement agencies and other um, multilateral development ban banks. So we can get information um, on an ad hoc basis. But for example, we couldn't get grand jury material. But so typically, what will happen is we'll get at least intelligence from um, DOJ or other organizations we're cooperating with, and then hopefully in some cases um, documents as well. But for example, if the, um, in this case, if company A's bank accounts were gone through a, um, through a grand jury subpoena, we may not be able to get access to that information. They may say like, you might wanna ask him in your you know, interview about his personal transfers, but then he could just lie to us. Um, so, <laughs> so, um, we, so, so there, there's, there are some limitations, but we can definitely, um, it's definitely information we can flow from them, from us to them. We just can't always get that information back depending on the, um, evidence sharing rules in those jurisdictions. Zoom uh, you, you talked about sanctions and mentioned your partner. Yeah. The reality is a lot of these projects are concession projects, 20 year concession where money of the World Bank is in place. So yeah, yeah. Do you do any monetary sanctions? Because generally that vendor is going to continue doing right. the road work. Doing right, yeah. And I mean, as with most sanction systems, our sanction system is prospective. So once you actually have a contract, unless you're harming the contract, I mean, typically they go on. There are times when we'll stop it if there's something, you know, really bad going on. Or, for example, you know, they're giving defective products that are hurting people. That, you know, sometimes. But that, the, the, um, operational decision about whether to shut down a contract has nothing to do with us. Like we just lay out the, whatever the sanctions are and then the operations people determine, you know, what they're going to do with the actual project. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, of monitoring. Yeah. I mean, we we're, we're always trying to determine what goes on, but is it, it can be a problem if there's a long-term contract. The, the world bank, it, I, we may have concession contracts, but for the most part, it's really more concentrated on, you know, specific infrastructure projects that are funded by us. So a lot of times like concession, like public private partnerships, concession projects will be like, okay, well, you know, you get the use of, a, you can build a bridge and then you get, you know, the, the, um, the payments back. But I mean, since we're doing upfront loans and grants, I, I mean, a lot of times we don't, they don't need to recoup the money through a concession because we're giving them the money up front. So the projects can be long term, but usually not like the 30 year concession types that you see in other contexts. We I, I'm sure there have been, but typically like our, since ours are loan based and grant based, um, the money is up front. You don't have to recoup it through a concession. So it can be structured a little bit. Does the government get sanctions or what? Well? <laughs> no, uh, no. Um, we, we, um, so it's a little interesting because in the world bank, you know, all the countries are members and often they're contributing members. Sometimes they're not, but almost every country except like Sudan and other 
more, you know, sort of less people that are countries that are barely country states. Uh, other than those countries, every country in the world is basically a member of the World Bank. So it would be like us, you know, sanctioning our members, which we don't do. I mean, we don't have jurisdiction over that. They're their own sovereigns. Um, and then in terms of, um, interestingly, we also don't have jurisdiction over the over government officials per se. But if government officials, there are government officials, for example, depending on how they set up the funding, it is possible that the um, the project implementation units, which are the um, organizations within the country that administer the contracts for the World Bank, there are times, you know, depending on the country and the way it's set up, that government officials are actually our contractors, um, meaning that they're receiving funding for their position through the World Bank as opposed to through the government. If that is the case, we can actually sanction those individuals as contractors of the World Bank as opposed to as government officials. But, you know, that just is a case by case basis. But we cannot, we don't sanction uh, the government. Joe or Nick, um, do the bank fraud statutes uh, in the United States cover uh, deals with the, with the World Bank and would you, and would you be looking at that as well? I'm not sure if they do, Joe. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's uh, a good question. Unless they're, uh, unless they're, uh, they're, the hook, jurisdictional hook could be if there's financing from federally insured financial institutions, perhaps you could make that argument, but I've never run across that particular issue before. Yeah, and we're not, I mean, we're, uh, uh, administratively, we're not considered a bank for purpose. I mean, there was a, <laughs> there was a Supreme Court case called IFC versus JAM that just uh, was um, last term they issued. And that basically said that the World Bank and other multilateral development banks are um, no longer completely immune. So up to now, I should say, we haven't been considered um, a, a, a financial institution for purposes of U.S. Um, regulatory <coughs> schemes. So I'm not sure. That, I think the bank fraud is, has to be a financial institution as defined by the statute. So we don't fall within that. So in terms of the technical bank fraud, I, I don't think we would be subject. I Is mean, there any other statute that uh, in the United States that applies to the world? Up to now, no, I mean, because we're we're a sovereign just in the same way. I mean, world, for example, World Bank officials are considered foreign officials for purposes of the FCPA. So, yeah, if, if we were if someone in at the, at the World Bank was involved in an FCPA scheme, then, um, you know, they in theory could be. And then we actually have internal mechanisms for punishing uh, employees if they're involved in a variety of things, including um fraud or corruption. Um, but typically, I mean, as a general matter, the World Bank is immune from, um, as an institution, um, and, and their employees are immune from uh, from law enforcement of other countries. So I, I assume you could use the usual mail fraud and wire fraud statutes. I think so, yeah. I think those would apply. So I can build this time, Sandy's question. I'm, I'm just going to build this hour to a client. But... Um, <laughs> supposed to be funny, but really wasn't, I guess. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, uh, so in terms of um, sanctions, um, the sanctions process, the operations part of MARA, part of the World Bank, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. That's, that's, that has its own litig it's a litigation process that you can go through. In other words, I'm representing company uh, uh, A, and I want to appear before the World Bank, and so you've missed it on the 50% plus one analysis. There's a process, right? I can go and go in and litigate. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, there's a variety, you know, we have a, we, companies involved go all the way from, you know, a huge company like Odebrecht to like a one or two person company who's just a local person bidding on a very small local project. So people, you know, the smaller the company, the less likely they are to be represented, you know, they, that you can appear pro se, no problem. Um, but we, you know, we often are up against very large firms um, who are advocating for their clients um, in all stages of the pro proceeding. And there, there is a chance to prevail, right? I mean, obviously presenting information, but that might have some consequences insofar as a parallel criminal case. Yeah, I think that would have bigger problems than perhaps in this case, because the subpoena has already been issued and right. it's so. hypothetical from, <laughs> from DOJ. So right. they may want to concentrate on, on those particular issues. Do you think, Joe, that the 
the usual circling the wagons defense uh, in this case between and uh, implementing a joint defense agreement between company A and company B would work or uh, is, is the cat out of the bag because uh, uh, you have employees of company B <coughs> who have already made admissions about forged yeah. documents. Yeah, in terms of that technique, I think it, it would be too late uh, my, in my view, but I do think ordinarily um, – Customarily, uh, you want to circle wagons if you can. I mean, uh, historically, it's it's changed a lot. Uh, uh, changed a lot. I say historically changed a lot with the with how the Rosenstein memo ch treats everything. So maybe it's something you want to touch on. But now it, it's become more and more um, each entity for itself. I think because yeah. you're trying to you're trying to rush into DOJ at least and kind of getting maybe a field. Trevor, so re reel us back in, but but I think you raise a good point, which is how do you defend this case? And uh, it looks like Company B is is exhibiting some uh, contrition already, which may be helping them. As well, even if Company B perhaps didn't want to uh, make any, any type of mission admissions, its employees have already in an audit yep. made significant admissions, and they're going to be stuck with that. Uh, probably separate counsel is going to have to be given to those employees. Right. Um, and uh, it's going to be hard for Company B not to go down the cooperation route at right. some point in time. Uh, uh, well, we don't, I mean, we don't know the size of Company B or, or where Company B is located. If it's uh, a local company in an in a, in a, in a emerging market, you know, would it care too much about the... Uh, I was just going to say, to, to sort of... Yeah be slightly depressing this <laughs> this is a hypothetical and i think we'd all agree we'd be very very lucky in most cases to get as far as this hypothetical has gone because yeah. of the inability to sort of properly cross borders and get into the relevant companies so i think more attention <coughs> needs to be paid at the initial disbursement and what the government controls are in place as to how those funds <coughs> Right. All of our jobs are easier. I mean, I, I think in the investigation, the, the government uh, investigators would work their way up from the admissions by the employees of Company B uh, to the direction by uh, Company B's uh, president or others, uh, and and begin to secure cooperation from those individuals, and ultimately use Company B and its officers against Company A. I think that would follow the traditional route here. And, right? and would Company uh, B, uh, in in providing that assistance, would it likely um, avoid much sanction themselves? Joe, I think uh, you know Company B would probably be negotiating a plea agreement, most likely, and uh, perhaps uh, trying to avoid. The indictment of individuals, uh, or uh, trying to engage in and obtain a deferred prosecution agreement. Right. Although it's not, I mean, it's not entirely clear that Company B would be subject to jurisdiction right. from the U.S. because, it, unlike Company A, there's no, like you said, there's no indication of where they are. And the other thing I just wanted to point out is that in the uh, Company B's admission would be sufficient for that uh, for the employee who is involved. We could debar him uh, or her. Individually, but then we also do have within our system respondee at superior. So, um, company B would also be uh, sanctioned. And Joe, it, it, the DOJ in these circumstances, how how would they conduct an investigation? What would be their approach in, in a situation like this? Um, the FBI. Sort of starting with that, I think the FBI would be on. Um, I've got a case right now in Africa, hypothetically. Just going to talk about a real case, uh, but anyway, but hypothetically, the you, you in, in a country, uh, so the FBI actually with uh, through MLA, mutual legal assistance treaties and cooperation agreements uh, would probably be try to get on the ground and uh, company uh, country X, which uh, hypothetically is a let's say a country in Africa, uh, and you mentioned Sudan, uh, maybe a country like that. Uh, and it's pretty, it's pretty, it's remarkable what can be obtained, um, the FBI can obtain in those situations. So that would be my thought on that. And then you also have sometimes uh, the AUSAs, uh, with the approval, if it's an FCPA case, uh, I think my office when I was in Atlanta as U.S. attorney said the, the rule was put in place because one of my AUSAs was kind of randomly going around the world too much and... Uh, 
put in place that every FCPA case has to be processed and approved by the fraud section and the department before it can be initiated. So there's a lot of oversight and, and thought that goes into the deployment of resources. I think in this case, if you're representing Company B, you're certainly interviewing the uh, employees and the accounting right. staff who made the admissions and determining how bad it is and how far up the chain it goes. Uh, and based upon that analysis, you're figuring whether or not you, you really have to run in and ma make uh, a uh, proffer to the Department of Justice to seek uh, some uh, cooperation credit early on, whether you're going to, uh, as mentioned by Mr. Pope, waive the attorney-client privilege. Uh, I think the, uh, the new changes to the Yates Memorandum indicate you can get partial credit, even if you don't give up all of the right. uh, individuals within the company but um, uh, and don't waive completely the attorney-client privilege. Um, all those things would have to be factored in uh, depending on how high uh, the criminality goes. Does it go to the highest levels of company B, uh, at which point then you're dealing with perhaps a different animal uh, because you're the, the company is corrupt to the top and uh, you may be not only negotiating a plea for the company, but plea for some of the corporate officers too. And we may find also that uh, Company B potentially is, as we find in many of the emerging markets, is state-owned or has shareholders who are. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what implications does that give to the case? Well, it, it would, to your point, it wouldn't be surprising, particularly in a categorized, you know, an emerging country is better than saying third world country, emerging country. Uh, and then also, uh, if you're dealing with a, a, a Chinese entity, you can't, there's no, there's no delineation between the public and private ownership. So it does create um, opportunities for the FCPA to be applied. Um, I think also, you, I mean, I think uh, with this large amount of money, um, and also I think perhaps you know, the the Internal Revenue Service waking up to what's going on, kind of coming back to the question you asked previously, who would be the agencies involved? I would want to have, if I were still prosecuting the IRS involved, helping me in this case, and then, uh, you know, utilizing the financial uh, task forces and uh, all that, because it, it seems like um, there, where you have this situation, Company A could have, I mean, I think we talked about this in other scenarios. You could have Company A doing the same sort of thing around the world in other locations. Uh, let's assume it's a large uh, construction entity based out of the United States. They now have a large set of problems. If, if that's, uh, and I think uh, Peter, uh, Mr. Pope was talking about this earlier. You don't want to jump to conclusions, but uh, you want to find out: is this a, an isolated situation, or is it? something that's an epidemic. Has anybody had the, the scenario where, uh, in this case, uh, the allegations were brought forward by a whistleblower, uh, perhaps to the World Bank directly, and that's what caused the audit. But has anybody had the situation where the whistleblower files an action, uh, whistleblower action, uh, because he's been retaliated against in the U.S. courts under Sarbanes-Axley or, or one of the U.S. Whistle, whistleblower protection laws. So you have to deal simultaneously with the whistleblower action as well as the Department of Justice investigation and how they intersect together. I, I just wanted to raise two two quick points. One is in terms of the definition of, you know, somebody was asking whether we can go after sovereigns. We can't go after sovereigns, but interestingly, we have no limitation of going after state-owned entities. So, for example, we recently um, sanctioned a Chinese um, state-owned entity. Um, so, so we actually cut off the sovereignty question at a different point than, than the FCPA. And then the other thing I just wanted to point out, where I was before at DOJ a few years ago at the money laundering and asset recovery section, in terms of like who would be, you know, going after these, um, doing the actual investigation, we had an internal forensic investigations unit. And so we would do, you know, MLATs and, and uh, subpoenas to banks and things like that. And then we literally had, uh, similarly to the SFO, we literally had in-house people who could crunch all the numbers um, and sort of trace things for us as well as cryptocurrency experts. We have a question at the back. Um, I just
<laughs> yeah, I, I would think I, I would think the judge would take that position because under the False Claims Act, uh, it's whether the, the federal fisc is is really at issue here, and even if it's only part partly federal money. Um, it still comes under the, the jurisdiction of the False Claims Act. It just complicates the issues when you have those parallel actions going on, where the, when you have a criminal investigation and perhaps a, even a declined uh, whistleblower lawsuit that the, a relator uh, under the key TAM statute is pursuing, um, and you have to deal with uh, a criminal investigation uh, and perhaps a... a, a an agency investigation like the World Bank also, um, because you have to fight simultaneously. And usually what you try to do is uh, obtain a stay of the civil action uh, if you can. Um, you know, the law is complicated in that area and there's no easy answer. Um, but you, you, you try not to fight on multiple fronts if you don't have to. Um, sorry, can I just ask you, if you assume Um, as, in terms of how would we prove that they've got that they? So in terms of what you would do, so you've been brought in by Company B mm -hmm. to advise them of this. What's your proof of you? Oh, we've been brought yeah. in by Company B. It'd be rare that we'd be brought in by Company B, I guess, um, to defend their position. Yeah. Um, so I, I like that switch. We're assuming that they're. <laughs> they behave well there. <laughs> um, well, I think in, 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 in the hypothetical, we're assuming that the company B have have inflated their invoices. Yeah. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you're asking me in terms well, of... Um, if, you, if you're advising company B, yeah. if you're reporting on your advice, you have to advise Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not a lawyer yeah. but for starters, but yeah. what I would so so in terms of, of their steps, they need to sort of be <laughs> proactive and demonstrate sort of okay, what, how were they approached by Company A? Uh, what what was the individual? What was the request of Company B in terms of their um, how they they were asked to um, inflate the invoices and build up a slush fund um, to uh, pay pay the bribe? So they need to sort of demonstrate as much as they can through the email trail and through the forensic accounting records that uh, what they actually paid and that they didn't benefit themselves. So what we'd be looking to do is demonstrate how the, the value of what they did genuinely acquire um, and then try and demonstrate sort of that the request was on from the other side. Uh, to inflate what they want. I think I'd be hiring Zoe uh, as part of my defense of Company B, perhaps uh, to demonstrate that uh, my, my client, Company B, uh, was extorted by Company exactly. A and, exactly. and, and pressured in order to go along with this, yeah. in order to make some sort of deal uh, with the serious fraud office, uh, in order to escape you know, complete destruction of mm -hmm. the company. Um, and you, you would have to do that by an analysis of the, the money, the, the inflated invoices, how much were they infl yeah. inflated, uh, what types of, of evidence was there of how pressure of company B and how the payments were made. So you could kind of button everything up and go into the serious fraud office to make that particular mm -hmm. argument that your company wasn't the, com the wasn't, culpable one yeah. or as culpable as company yeah, A. Yeah, you'd have a full set of documentation showing the exact amounts. And even on the Bitcoin, you know, because that's the start mm -hmm. of the payment of the, the kickbacks is how did they affect the, the Bitcoin transactions that start the, the trail rolling that the DOJ and, and has, has sort of seen the end of in, in its capture of emails. So, Nick, would you see some exposure from a compliance perspective for Wells Fargo or, or the Bitcoin ledger? Um, yeah, the, the, the banks are, he are heavy into compliance. And so if there was any sort of insider inside of Wells Fargo who was facilitating this and, you know, the, the obligation on uh, them to file currency transaction reports and other information is proactive with the government. If they weren't following all the rules and obligations they have as a bank to make disclosures, it's some, something that just sort of pops into my head when you ask the question. Um, but 
uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if they see anomalies and they, they need, uh, banks have to look for anomalies these days and make sure they're being careful about who they're banking with, know your customer. So those those rules, I think, would apply here to these transactions. Um, and that's, that's all I can think of this morning with just recovering from jet lag. But uh, anything, anything I, I think else? what you would want to do is after Zoe completes her analysis, you would then have to quickly, uh, if you can, circle the wagons. Because I think the first thing the prosecutors are going to do is they're going to go to the girlfriend and lean on her um, yeah. and see if they can enlist her cooperation very quickly because that gets them uh, right directly into – Right. Uh, who she's sleeping with uh, at Company A? So yeah, those count, those accounts could be frozen um, uh, more readily than you, you can imagine. I mean, uh, so many times. Uh, I mean, I'm in the, this business to be paid to do what I do. We all are, right? And then, and the government knows that. And so the first thing they're going to go after is, you know, is the economic cash stream. And so uh, that could that could happen. I know. And we see more and more civil forfeiture and right. criminal forfeiture, so, even before the a, a, a indictment is brought. So you've got the, the right the pro, the the civil forfeiture, would, as Nick suggests, would precede the the, uh, the actual criminal <coughs> forfeiture, which would actually be sometimes included in the would be included in the indictment. But um, having having been around in the, in the Wild West days years ago. Uh, when we were seizing the assets of uh, drug traffickers around the world, uh, I think I think hopefully the standards are greater than they were then. But it's just amazing uh, the the threat of seizure and and forfeiture. Um, I mean, it determines who your counsel is going to be. So I do think that's really important. And just one more point to add on that. Um, I think the, the first question we would ask was, have they ever worked for Company A before? Because if they have then mm-hmm. there's a much bigger problem and a much bigger case right. to investigate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if it's the first time, then it's it's going to be yeah. easier to try and so, understand why they were selected. And, and, um, and, and the, the answer, another answer to this question is, <laughs> who would you who do you want to represent in this whole scenario? And it would be Wells Fargo, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where the money is. We've probably, um, probably got time for one last question, so Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. So we have we have a voluntary self disclosure program where you can come in. Um, we don't actually get that many, surprisingly. Um, so it's not like the FCPA um, where people just run in and are constantly like spilling their guts. Um, <laughs> but uh, but but there there is a program in place that they can do that. Um, and we do have the discretion, you know, if they g- give. Uh, sufficient um, cooperation to give them no no um, debarment period. And that the cross debarment, if, if you are um, debarred for more than a year, we have an agreement with basically all the other major multilateral development banks that you will be cross debarred as well. I mean, we provide them like minimal information sort of just so that they can satisfy themselves that our, our evidence satisfies their um, standards, which are, can be slightly different. Um, so you want to, you know, especially avoid being above a year if you can. I would imagine you're going to the World Bank probably second after. If you're going to make that decision to cooperate, make a disclosure, uh, you're probably going to either the serious fraud office first or the Department of Justice or both. And then ultimately to the World Bank uh, because you need to get out in front of the problem. Yeah. I mean, if you have we're more likely to hear about it if it's in the context of a of a situation like the FCPA where you're going to self-disclose otherwise. Um, and you you much rather be in front of the World Bank than the Department of Justice <laughs> yeah. or the UK. Uh, well, depending, so. depending. I mean, no one's going to jail because of us, but if you're, you know, if 90% of your business is World Bank um, business, then you are probably more scared of us than you are of the of Of course, if you, do, if you debar, then other uh, development agencies right. also debar. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it depends on what, 
proportion of your business is involved in international projects funded by multilateral development banks. So, Major just talked about fraud. There'd be a big difference between U.S. law and English law on the corporate liability. Right. So, yes, you have to look at or the U.S. company might be in line with your company here. If you pay a company here, and it's this low level of misconduct by, by staff, you may not have any Right, but then we would, right, but then we would report to the U.S. and the U.S. probably could find but some kind of jurisdiction. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I think it just depends on how bad the facts are and what yeah. what you think the government can might be able to prove. If the allegations are like we've had in this mm -hmm. hypothetical. Uh, they're on the bad side, so you would probably be running to DOJ and serious fraud office first to make a deal if that was the best course of action for the client. Okay, so I think that comes to the end of part one. I think we've got a break now till part two, but I'd like to thank the panel for the great conversation, making my life very easy. Thank you.